I wanted to go over a couple things with you guys. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to use these yet. Um, it turns out that the ISKI lifter from where the push rod seats right here to the wheel. So the dimension from the push rod cup to the wheel is 300,000 shorter than what I was using. So these from right here from the push rod seat or the cup to the wheel, these are 300 thousandths taller. And I didn't have time to get longer push rods, which unfortunately almost every time I rebuild this engine, um, it seems like I have to get new push rods, either the cam base circle changes or, you know, some other unforeseen factor. So what I did is with the original lifters that were in the engine, and then I had this old set that's got 40 passes on it. I, I got a good set out of those. They're used, but they're good. And so uh, just for this race uh, coming up next Saturday, I am going to run the used lifters that I already had. So between the set in here and the set that's used in that box, I was able to find 16 good ones. So that's what we're doing. We're putting it back together right now, and I'm going to race next Saturday, a week from today, hopefully, if everything goes right. So we're just putting valve train together right now. And I have one rocker arm off because it gives me a chance to show you guys the oil feature and how this works. So this is the adjuster. Here's the lock nut for the adjuster. And if I take the adjuster out, you can see there's a section here that's not threaded. So oil can get around that section. So the oil goes up through the push rod, right? It goes into this little hole, but th it's blocked on the top. These adjusters do not go all the way through. So the oil goes into this hole and it actually comes out into this void. And then if I unscrew this all the way, there's a hole you can see it up in there. It's uh, on that, there's a little hole you can see and what, where that oil goes. So that, so it goes into the adjuster. It goes into this little void area where there's no threads. And so it's kind of like a banjo fitting. It goes into that hole and then you see this little dinky hole right there. It shoots the oil out right on the side of the valve spring. So the push rod length is really critical because this little adjuster has to be screwed up into the rocker arm enough that this void in the thread is in alignment with that little hole right there. In other words, if this adjuster isn't screwed in far enough or if it's screwed in too far, well, actually you can't screw it in too far. The further it's in, the better. And I like that anyway because the closer this cup is to the rocker arm, the stronger. This, you know, I don't like these adjusters to be hanging, even when I ran Jessel, I did not have these rocker adjusters hanging way out there to dry because it just, so that little, that little notch needs to be screwed up inside the rocker so that the oil hole and the notch align, that makes sense, so that when the oil goes through this hole in the adjuster and then out into that void area, that void area is in line with the oil hole that sends the oil out here and here. Also has an oil hole that you can see right there. So it's got the little tiny one for the valve spring. It's got this one here. And that of course sends it to the, to the roller tip. So that bearing gets oiled. And of course it goes on top of the valve as well. On some of these, I have the push rod length so close that uh, this thing is screwed all the way into the rocker arm like literally like that. And it's only screwed down like 15 or 20 thousandths. So it makes this very sturdy. It makes it, you know, there's a lot of support for this adjuster. I've had the Jessel ones break off before. And I'm not bagging on Jessel. They're, they're a good product too. I'm just saying the more you have these turned up into the rocker arm, the better because it makes them a lot stronger. These are a TND rocker, by the way. They're, they're so old, I custom ordered these for this engine, 
um, that these don't even have the TND logo on them. So if that tells you, this engine was probably put together in the late 80s, I want to say, maybe around 1990. And then it's been upgraded several times through the years. And I probably did these around 1990, I would say. So they're still pretty old. You might say, why is it so important? Why the big deal about the oiling feature on the rocker arm? Well, we used to run these engines in pro stock. In fact, this engine was in a qualifying car. And these two oil galley plugs actually used to be a restrictor screwed into both of those. So it restricts the oil to the lifters, which in turn restricts the amount of oil that's going to go up the push rod which would in turn restrict the amount of oil on the valve spring. And we were lucky if we got 10 runs out of a set of valve springs. It just, these things just killed valve springs. One of the things we also used to do is we put screen everywhere. There's screen there. And then you can see just a little bit of screen right here. And it, this used to be screened all the way down. A small block Chevy doesn't have an opening in the valley like this, but the big block has these oval openings. And so they were screened, and that was just to catch loose parts. If we had anything go wrong in the valve train that ended up in the valley, it wouldn't end up going down into the rotating assembly. And then I got the brainy idea. I thought, well, why are we even letting the oil return back down and get hit by the rotating assembly, which the parasitic drag alone of the crankshaft having to move oil out of its way when it's at 9,000 RPM is it's a lot it's it's this modification right here i've actually had some commenters make fun but they have no idea what they're making fun of not letting the oil go back down and hit the crankshaft and all the rotating parts was a huge horsepower gain and it also was huge for oil control and not having foam in your oil it was the fact that they already had the screen in here that it gave me the idea and you can see there's two different kinds of epoxy. Here's the original that was that was epoxying the screen in. And then I added all of this. I thought, let's just block the whole thing off. Let's pull the restrictors out of the block. Let's let full oil pressure go to the lifters, full oil pressure go up the push rods, change over to these TND rockers that have the oil feature that goes through the adjuster internally through the rocker arm and shoots the oil right onto the side of the valve spring so it cools them and because it's a triple spring they also rub against each other which causes heat and wear and then that heat causes them to either break or lose their spring pressure really fast and so your next question and it's a good one well what happens how does the oil get back into the oil pan well i'll answer that question real quick here too so what I did, since it's a dry sump oiling system, see that hose connection right there? This tube under the intake manifold, let me back up. So this is a pickup tube. So when the manifold's on the engine, that pickup tube is right there. So all the oil is going to get to the top end, you're accelerating, so it's gonna make all the oil go to the back of the head. It's gonna return through here. And then instead of all that oil going back down and getting whipped by the crankshaft, it's gonna get sucked out of the valley and it's gonna go right back into the dry sump tank. And in fact, this is the line. Let me back out so you can see it because it's not hooked up yet. But this line right here hooks to that hose fitting and it pulls all the oil out of the lifter valley. And it's, it's worked really, really well, if I do say so myself. It, it was a great innovation on this setup. And instead of getting 10 runs out of a set of springs, these springs right here have 100 passes on them and they're still fine. It made a huge, huge improvement on the lifespan. So to summarize, when you're running a super high RPM deal. This is not a power adder engine. This engine runs, it's just mo motor only. It's naturally aspirated. It makes 1200 horsepower. It's 500 cubic inch deal. Um, oil control is absolutely essential. You have to have oil control because your oil will just get beat into foam 
it's a huge parasitic loss in horsepower, you know, with the crankshaft having to move the oil out of the way, the crank and the rods and, you know, all the rotating mass. And so it's got a dry sump, which means it's sucking all the oil out of the pan. It's sucking all the oil out of here. The pump is external, which is this guy right here. And there's uh, three stages of it are sucking, two out of the pan, one out of the valley. And then one of the stages is the pressure, which is this guy right here. And then he loops around right there and puts oil pressure right into the oil filter boss. And then you got eight quarts of undisturbed uh, oil in this tank. Now, since I'm a geezer and I don't have access to a dyno anymore and a, you know, a full machine shop and all the stuff that we used to do. I just, it is what it is. I'm a one man show and I'm like everybody else on a budget. But one of the things we used to do with our wet sump engines is uh, pretend this is a stock oil pan right here and you got a drain plug. We would put a, we'd take the drain plug out and we'd put a bung, put screw in a, a you know, a hose barb, we'd take a clear piece of tubing and shove it on that hose barb. And then we just loop the tubing up. So it was sitting up above the oil. And what that did is it made it so we could actually see the oil level in the clear tube while we ran the engine on the dyno. And just doing a fairly moderate big block Chevy, for example, that say made 650 horsepower, uh, startlingly, that tube, the oil would be up here, well, wherever it would be in the pan, within six seconds of the dyno pull, the oil would disappear out of the tube. It was gone, so, which means the pan was pumped dry, all the oil was in the top of the motor, and then when we'd shut the, you know, stop the pull and shut the engine off, as the oil returned back to the pan, and it started filling the clear piece of tubing back up, it would be completely, it looked like foam. It literally didn't even look like oil. It was, had, it was so aerated, it just looked like foam. And so we realized that if you're drag racing with that scenario, six seconds into your run, you basically have no oil pressure or you have intermittent oil pressure at best. So to summarize, oil control in any engine is critical, but when you're running a super high RPM deal, uh, it's, it's, not possible unless you have really, really good oil control. And this engine does. It's never uh, a worry or an issue of whether it's going to have oil pressure during a run. Um, I have a pro light on the oil pressure. If it drops below 30 pounds, it comes on. And I have never seen that light come on during a pass. So uh, once in a great while, if it's a quarter mile pass, um, because I'm going a lot faster and I use a parachute, uh, under deceleration, I have seen it just bump on like literally for a split second, it'll bump on. And some of that is because all this oil rushes to the front. So it's not being picked up by this rear pickup tube anymore. And, um, it's all rushed to the front of the oil pan as well. And there's quite a bit of pan. Here's the front pickup for the dry sump and you got oil pan clear up here. So it is even with this theoretically possible, but uh, it's never been an issue. Every time I've taken this apart, the bearings look absolutely perfect. There's no evidence of oil starvation and oil control is the name of the game. My name is not Ron, but I approve this message.